All right, GM, GM, and welcome everybody to Numbers Therapy, episode 51. 51, holy shit. Uh, today's episode titled, Picking Up the Pieces, a Failed Project Postmortem. Here at Numbers Therapy, we're talking through the macro, operational, financial, technical, trading-based, and other dimensions of Web3 to help us all elevate while, of course, having some good laughs along the way. For everyone who's live, please feel free to ask questions and drop them into the guest questions chat, whether they're intro or more advanced. We'll be sure to make sure uh, we account for them. Lastly, Numbers Therapy is rated NFA as in none of what you hear and hear is financial advice. So without further ado, and on to today's guest and episode. Today's episode is a particularly unusual one for a variety of reasons. For one, we don't often post-mortem and dissect projects at a more granular, organized level. Equally, we don't often have a guest so willing to come on and share and talk through this experience. Needless to say, being an entrepreneur, especially in this market, is incredibly hard. Yet our beloved guest today, both a resident favorite in MBHQ and Yuga Maxi, has graciously offered to come on Numbers Therapy today and dissect his quote-unquote failed project. He's a really smart and thoughtful guy, and the hope is this analysis and synthesis will enable many people to draw insights and parallels, especially if they're, th if they're thinking about launching a project at some point. And for those who already have a project or are part of a team, enable the time and headspace to think through and break down the dynamics of a project. He's truly, a truly awesome, open, and smart guy. Very happy to have this guy as a friend and a colleague, and very thankful to have him be so open and sharing the challenge. Equally, I do not think this will be the last that we will see of him, project-wise, especially with experience and perspective like his. Please, everyone, welcome Raga Prince and Stage. Everyone, Raga, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. I've uh, listened to 50 episodes of Numbers Therapy now, and each one, whenever you do an intro like that, I'm like, what would an intro for me sound like? And uh, <laughs> you did not disappoint. <laughs> good, good, good. I'm, ha I'm happy to hear that. Thank you for saying that. Um, I, I mean, I think in your case, it's an easy one to tee up. You're a very beloved person within MDHQ for all, all your thought and openness and, and, and always kind of helping everyone. So easy peasy today. Um, let's let's take it from the top like we usually do. Can you walk us through your background before Web3, maybe lay some foundation on your gaming background as well to point, point us towards the conversation today? Yeah, yeah. So... Um, I got into Web3 um, similar to some people, but probably different than most. Um, I, I was probably what people would think of as like a sneaker kid. Um, I had uh, in 2020, um, around the time that COVID hit, I dropped out of college. Um, I was going for a business degree and I dropped out of college. It was just too expensive. I, I wasn't really getting anything out of it. I, I wanted to kind of you know, go off and do my own thing and, and start and run businesses of my own. Um, so I dropped out of college and I uh, started running, I kind of fell into it. I started running a cook group. It, it's kind of like the sneaker reselling equivalent of, you know, alpha groups in the NFT space. Um, and I ran that group for probably about a year, year and a half or so. Um, and towards the end of my time running that group was when NFTs started to kind of become big. Um, and initially, kind of during the Top Shot era, um, I had kind of ignored them. I was like, oh, that's, that's silly, you know, and, and I'm not a sports guy. So um, I, I kind of passed that by. And then, you know, I was, I was vaguely aware of Board Ape Yacht Club when it launched, kind of passed that by. Around like September, October of 2021, I couldn't ignore it anymore um, because it started to become necessary for cook groups to have NFT information. Um, and so I had, um, you know, looked around for different uh, staff or providers to get the group and, and get me up to speed on, uh, you know, what NFTs are and how we could resell them and make money. Um, and I had stumbled upon uh, a company called Ocean Services. Um, and it was just like a they, they basically pooled a bunch of NFT callers together um, into the same server and then like mirrored all of their information into various Discord servers. It was actually a really great business model for the time. Um, and I was his like second client. Um, probably a week or so after I uh, had had his services, and, and, you know, learning about NFTs myself for the past couple of weeks since I had gotten into it, I, I messaged him and I was like, 
your service kind of sucks. I can do so much better myself. Um, and he comes back to me with essentially, well, why don't you just work for me then? Um, so I had kind of, you know, at, at that time, um, the Cook Group was kind of nearing the end of its life. It was going to be sold off within the next couple of months. Um, and it was a really uh, opportune time for me to transition into something that um, I, I started to care about a lot more, um, which was kind of NFTs and Web3. So I ran uh, Ocean Services for probably another year and a half. And so all we did was... Um, provide NFT, you know, information, analytics, editorial content um, to a lot of different cook groups and alpha groups in the space um, at, at one point or another. Um, and during that whole period, um, I started working on uh, Invictus Order, which obviously we'll get into. That sounds great. Yeah, that's it's great context. By the way, per your sports comment that you said earlier, I'm pretty sure I saw a metric that said 30% of people who were buying Top Shot weren't even sport fans either for whatever it's worth. Uh, no, yeah, I, I, that's I probably totally all the sneaker kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably true, though, even though I totally made up that metric right now. Um, got it. So I, I believe somewhere in between there, though, you came from some gaming background as well, right? So even before NFTs were NFTs, you were – I believe you were working through the process of selling assets, gaming assets, and old – kind of Web 2 format. Is that accurate? And can you give some background there too? Yeah. So when I was a kid, and, and this all, you know, eventually ties into to our project. So when I was a kid, I started playing a game called Spiral Knights, and I loved it, and I still love it. Um, and Spiral Knights had what's referred to as a player-driven market. It's, it's an open economy. Anyone can sell or trade anything to anyone else um, via the game's in-game currency. Um, and it was also on the Steam market. It was uh, actually one of the first free-to-play games on Steam. Um, and it was on the Steam market, and so you could trade Spiral Knights assets with TF2 keys or CSGO keys. Um, and so I, I did some of that as well. But um, initially, I was just playing the game. I was just a kid. I was just having fun. Um, and I had um, met a guy who um, he was what was referred to in the game as a merchant. He, you know, bought and sold stuff. And, you know, as a kid playing a game, I just want the cool sword. I just want the cool outfits, you know. And so uh, trading items was an avenue for me to get the cool stuff that I wanted. Um, and, and so I kind of, you know, followed him around and, and poked him and prodded him and tried to learn from him. Um, and he eventually took a liking to me. Um, and kind of taught me the ropes and, you know, I, I just traded assets in Spiral Knights. And so, you know, at, at 12 or 13 years old, I was like, hey, mom, can I uh, sign into your PayPal? I have uh, <laughs> I have somebody that needs to needs to send me money. And I, you know, I just get somebody to send me, you know, 200 bucks for uh, a, a virtual gun or I'd sell, mm -hmm. you know, their their premium currency, which, by the way, <laughs> Uh, and, and we might actually get into this a little bit later. I, I think it's pertinent to talk about. That was against the terms of service of the game, um, oh. which, you know, so so that is kind of a, a dynamic at play. So I had, you know, sold these, you know, video game currency, video game assets, um, you know, from maybe 12 or 13 up into maybe 17 or 18 as the game kind of slowly died down. Um, but it, it was all, always mostly Spiral Knights. That was kind of my, my niche, my love, my, my long-term interest. In your experience with Spiral Knights or even otherwise, especially for those less familiar, how strictly did they enforce the not for resale kind of terms and conditions in your experience? Did they, did they patch it? Were they vigilant about it? Did they shut people's accounts? Like generally, generally so, speaking, what, what was your vantage point? They, it, it was hard for them to track, especially the way that we did it, where, um, you know, some, sometimes we'd be trading, you know, 500 or $1,000 worth of, of video game assets at a time, which was, you know, somewhat significant. Um, and it would have to be, you, you'd have to, like, mix other shitty items into the mix, or it'd have to be like, you know, you'd send them a message to be like, hey, happy birthday, you know, and, and send them stuff like that. Um, so it, it, it was an interesting dynamic, but if they caught you, they'd ban you outright. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had actually gotten sort of kind of caught and warned at a certain point, um, and I kind of stopped from that point on. It just, it, one, it was less worth it, and two, I didn't want my account of, you know, a decade to get banned. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I mean, because you weren't in Top Shot, you missed it, but that sounds strikingly similar to some... Uh, fishy trades that many of us saw in Top Shot mm -hmm. earlier, where it was a huge asset for a one dollar 
piece of junk, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. It sounds very interestingly parallel <laughs> to what you're saying. All right, before we go even more in the direction of, of where we're heading today, one question that, that is on my mind, that may be on others' minds as well, um, take us to the pathway of you becoming the Yuga Maxi that you are. What are you seeing? Why are you so attached to it? What do you think is so good? What's your take on it? We're curious to hear about that a little bit. So, and I'll, I'll reference another podcast. Um, it's the fucking metaverse. It's the, the podcast that they, the, the founders of Board Ape Yacht Club did. Um, and in their first episode, they had Alexis Ohanian on there. And they were just talking about video games and, like, their background in video games. And they had talked about, um, I, I think Gordon at one point had said, um, man, I, I really wish that I could still have my character in, uh, like, some, some old Star Wars game. Um, and, you know, they, they all kind of, you know, echoed that sentiment or, you know, I, I really wish I could still have my, you know, this and this and that in EverQuest, you know, some, some old online game. Um, and, and that really struck home for me for Spiral Knights because that's been, you know, my, my game, my love for the last decade. And it's, it's a slowly dying game. It's, it's really just been, you know, like every day it's kind of like, oh, is Spiral Knights going to shut down today? Maybe. Um, and, and so um, NFTs and, and that kind of concept that they were gravitating towards with sort of that, that interoperability and the, the asset or, or the gaming asset that carries through multiple different experiences or multiple different games um, really struck a chord with me. Yeah, that makes total sense. And and did you do you think particularly? I mean, there's other good projects that exist out there, right? It's not limited to to Yuga, and you know, there, there's all the other usual suspects that exist that in the current climate have varying response to them. But there's all the other big guys as well. But you seem to be. I, I think everybody's generally speaking bullish on Yuga, but you unusually so. So what is it you're seeing with them particularly that that really stands out? And and equally, what do you what is your quick take on the current state there as well with Yuga, right? There there've definitely been not all positive comments relating to everything they're doing, even though they're you know, they're they're kind of the gold standard. Um, what what's your current take on it and why why them particularly? Why do you think they really stand out? So when when I think of businesses and when I think of companies, I think that any business or any company has the potential to last 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, be, you know, a company of great stature, you know, the Walmarts, the Sonys, the, um, you know, P&Gs, the uh, Goldman Sachs of the world. Um, it, 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 it can be, any company can become one of those companies that transcends lifetimes, you know, companies that are now, you know, 200 or 250 years old. Any company has that potential. Um, and I think that Yuga, um, because it's so unique in terms of corporate history and in just the sheer amount of money and interest and fame that they got up front instead of, you know, 10 or 20 years down the line after a ton of hard work, um, Yuga is in a unique place. They have an immense amount of opportunity, but they also have an immense amount of risk and responsibility that comes with that opportunity um, simply because of how much money they made, how quickly they made it. Um, so I think that Yuga, Yuga for me is kind of synonymous with the NFT space, with uh, blockchain technology, and, and with gaming, the intersections of all of those three things. And, and those are things that I care about, obviously. And so, you know, if Yuga is leading the charge on those things that I care about, I have to, I have to hope and I have to strive for... Um, Yuga to get to that point of being a company that can last 20 years, 50 years, 100 years. Got it. Yeah, that makes total sense. Okay, that, that's perfect framing, actually, because now you've got your anchor, right? The anchor is we've seen that, you know, someone like Yuga can do it really well, connects to gaming, like you said, which is certainly your background. So for, in your case, with your project, can you give a little bit of background there in terms of, you know, what was your impetus? What was the catalyst that caused you to start your, your own project originally, if you remember? So, um, and th this will go back to kind of my mentor uh, in, in Spiral Nights. He, he's kind of become my 
almost business or, or life mentor at this point, um, you know, be, far beyond just Spiral Knights. And um, when I had started getting into NFTs, um, he, he, he's been involved in crypto for the last, I don't know, three, five years or so. Um, and when I started getting involved in NFTs, I was trying to, to poke him and prod him with, with NFT stuff. I was like, oh, this, this NFT stuff. And we got on, you know, the conversation of like, if we made a project, what would it look like? Um, and, and initially, it was, you know, pr- probably similar to to uh, a lot of other people's thoughts around making a project in the NFT space where it was like, these guys are making millions. How can we do that? You know? Um, and, you know, we, we had started thinking about like, like what's, what's something that we, we both care about and that we're both passionate about that we can get behind um, and want to make a project about um, because he and I are both, both very like morally sound people. We really try to be honest. We try to be upfront. We try to do everything by the book. Um, and so we wanted to make money, certainly, but we wanted to kind of do it the right way uh, and wanted to not, you know, compromise our virtues and values in the process. Um, and, and so we kind of landed on on Spiral Lights. We were just like, man, we've we've been together for you know six or seven years now. Not. Sorry, that sounded. Uh, he, he's not my partner in a relationship. He's my business partner. But I've known him for, no. for six or seven years now, um, and um, we, we've you know always played Spiral Knights and we've always you know traded stuff in Spiral Knights. Um, why not do something about Spiral Knights? And you know the the other kind of angle to that was. Spiral Knights has had a kind of fraught history. Um, It was initially very successful, like I said earlier, being one of the first free-to-play games on Steam. Um, And then uh, early on in its history, after about a year and a half, um, it got acquired by Sega. Um, And then Sega kind of, you know, it definitely pumped some updates into it. It owned it for about a year, year and a half or so. Um, And it kind of milked it dry and, you know, kind of threw it on the floor and said, we're we're not interested in you anymore. Um, And so for the last six or seven years or so, um, the game's basically been on life support. It's it's a really small, uh, maybe 200 players, uh, 200 active concurrent players. Uh, It's a small, passionate community. Um, And so we, we kind of thought maybe there's a way for us to, you know, make a business, you know, work together because we you know love working with each other um make some money in the process and and save our beloved game yeah that, that makes sense I, I like your your verbiage that you use of a small passionate community that's like calling that's like being in new york and calling an apartment cozy is what it is <laughs> like, you, i kind of like know what it insinuates really, really yeah fast. <laughs> yeah a small passionate community or a dead game you can choose <laughs> <laughs> my mind Fine line. So, okay, so you had the kind of frame in mind there, but what was what was your thesis and vision on it? Was it, you know, was it something like Web3 and, and the value that exists there could resuscitate it? Like, what, what was the general thesis and vision you had with it, you know, beyond the frame? So, so the idea was really to kind of wrangle it away from the current owners. Um, for, for all of their flaws, um, they've kept the game online for a decade, you know, over a decade now. Um, And, you know, with a a player base of 150, 200 people, that's not an easy task. Um, And and so, you know, but, but there hasn't been any, you know, significant development on the game in seven years. It's kind of just been stagnant. It, it's kind of just been a keep the lights on kind of business for them. Um, and so, you know, we, we love the game. We wanted to see it flourish. We wanted to see more content. We wanted the story to be finished. The the, the story of the game isn't even complete. So um, we wanted to kind of take it a little bit further. And so our thought was, Okay, you know, there, there's a lot of money in this NFT space here, and and people are throwing money at projects that are doing absolutely nothing, you know, um, and people are throwing uh, money at these projects who are making claims that they're going to develop a game, um, and, and so I, I was like, what if we just acquire it outright? You know, that that would be a, a completely different dynamic to a lot of the other projects in the space right now, where they're saying, oh, we're going to take, you know all of this money up front, and then we're going to take, you know, three to five years to develop a game and, and probably fail in the process. Um, we, we thought, you know, if we could raise enough money, we could acquire the game outright and start with a game already made. Um, yeah. And then, you know, along the way, incorporate NFT technology kind of when and where it made sense. That's interesting. Cause it sounds like it's the combination of, you know, do it by the books plus existing a little bit of existing brand equity existing product as well to some extent build on top of it 
and just kind of general trust and melding that all together was kind of the recipe. So, okay, so you had your recipe, you know, you know, what'd you do next? What was your, you know, what, what steps did you take? Is it related to product marketing? Like what, what were the next steps that you take, you took on the project? Fumbled around in the dark. <laughs> uh, <laughs> essentially that's, that's what it was for the first a uh, couple of months. Um, so on our team, we, we had a, you know, a small team of relatively um, well-respected members of the Spiral Knights community. These were all Spiral Knights players. Uh, myself and my partner, Eric, uh, kind of handled the business side of things. Um, any of the, um, you know, the finance stuff, the legal stuff, you know, structuring the business, um, all of that stuff we kind of handled. And then obviously kind of the NFT side of things, the Web3 side of things. Um, and then we had um, we had a game developer on our team. Um, and then we also had a, um, a graphic designer on our team, um, both of whom uh, eventually left the team uh, because they didn't really... They didn't really jive with the NFT side of things. The, mm -hmm. Their goal kind of was, you know, for the game. They they loved the game, um, but they they couldn't get behind the NFT side of things. So they had eventually left the team on good terms. Um, and then we had uh, two other guys who kind of handled the game design, so like the lore and you know new weapons and new missions and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and between both of them, they probably had. I don't know, 100 pages of lore and possible updates to the game. Um, and then we had our artist. Um, and so, you know, between those three things, we kind of had the, the business side and the NFT side of things, um, which also included kind of our conversations with the current um, uh, company that owns Spiral Knights, which is Grey Havens. Um, so Eric, uh, being that he kind of already had a relationship with the team at Grey Havens, he kind of headed up that. So, you know, the LLC was started, uh, and two days later we had a letter shot off to Grey Havens, um, a month later, we had a business plan, you know, a 35-page business plan shot off to Grey Havens. Um, and, you know, all that time we were kind of, uh, our artist was working on the art. And then we had the, the two other guys that were doing kind of the lore stuff and, you know, already planning out possible updates that we would make to the game once we acquired it. That, that's great foundation. And it sounds like you put a lot of thought and emphasis into, like, refining the product and, and the nuance and kind of where it would go and the right people around that. What, what about on the marketing side of things? Did you have an explicit hype person on that side and, and, and multi and omni-channel marketing person? Like, what would the marketing side look like? And, you know, how are you guys spending, spending your attention there? This, this is where we start to get into some of the issues and the failures. Because, and, and so, so as I was kind of the, the NFT guy heading up, you know, the, the NFT stuff. And so they relied on me and trusted me for a lot of, like, just what's going on in the space and what is the standards and, and how do people market and how are projects made and all of that kind of stuff. Um, the connections with the space, that was all kind of me. Um, and, and Eric kind of took the back seat when it came to anything NFT related. Um, and, and to be frank, he's not a marketer either. Neither of us are, are really, uh, we, we don't really have that marketing gene. Um, and so I, frankly, I kind of operated under the delusion that if we make a good product, if we are good people, um, then they will come. You know, if, if we're if we're moral people, if we're transparent about what we're doing, if we're making a genuine business, if we're trying to deliver value to people, then they will come. Um, and, and so, in a lot of places, the marketing was us, and it was the product itself. We tried to really lean on the fact that we are all really passionate about this, we are all doxxed, we all have, you know, experience in, you know, the areas that we needed experience. Um, and so, you know, I, I think if we're starting to get into some of the, the places where it went wrong, we really didn't have that much marketing. I think um, I struggled a lot with the the very hype marketing, the the giveaway of allowless spots, you know, the 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 connections and the a lot of the underhanded stuff. I, I tried to not do that as much as possible, um, but in the process, I kind of devalued actual marketing. Yeah, it's it's an interesting point in, in reflection that you had, and you know, uh, I mean, we've certainly learned right between many of us 
that in, in many cases, marketing is arguably more important than the product. But mm -hmm. I'm trying to think through in your case specifically whether the things you're talking about, about being decent, decent people and good product and good roadmap and everything is even necessary but not sufficient. And, and trying to think through that for a second. And, and I, I, like the conclusion I'm coming to off what you're saying to some extent is in maybe in the future, it'll, it'll be necessary but not sufficient, right? In, in a world in which the investors and traders have a higher standard of what to expect. Maybe we're heading in that I, direction. I agree. Right? We, we were far too, I, I don't want to say ahead of our time because that sounds kind of pompous, but like <laughs> for lack of a better term, ahead of our time. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think in the future it would be necessary but not sufficient. But I also even wonder to some extent in the current form whether it's not even like a necessary but, but not sufficient thing, but almost more of like an introspective question because there are plenty of people you know, it's kind of akin to startups, I guess, but there are plenty of people who would release just with heavy, heavy hype and without very, with a very limited amount to back it or maybe just a roadmap or like the talk of a roadmap or something, right? Just some angles and hype and, and over, over demand and over hype and just literally load off of that and be comfortable with it. It almost feels partly like more of a, a personal decision in the current juncture of like how solid you want it to be, how doxed or undoxed you want the it, team it, to be. It certainly was. It was certainly a personal decision. I was yeah. very, very adamant about doing things. Uh, I, I want to say almost like righteously. I, I think that that's the best word for it. I was, I was very righteous about how I wanted the project to be made. I, I was disappointed and saddened with with the space as it progressed over the course of the project it just got worse and worse and worse seeing you know this founder rug this project but make 20 million dollars or you know this founder you know they, they they had this thriving community and then it got destroyed because they rugged or you know an undoxed person made this amount of money or some horribly shitty terrible project made you know 100k in the course of 10 minutes because they minted out you know 10k collection at you know 0.02 or something like that so uh, i i continue to get more and more disappointed with the space and i think that my own um my own feelings was like we're we can be better we, we can be something different um and, and i do believe i think i latched on to that a little bit too hard i was i was too moralistic i was too righteous well, we, we, have, we have two elements, to, to, you know, two factors that are governing that naturally, in my opinion, right? One is investors and traders will naturally only mint things at the right price with the right risk level, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So they get smarter, which is what's been happening Two, you know, regulation in theory at some point, yeah. right? Yeah. Which is a position that, you know, a risk that you didn't want to put yourself or your co-founder in, needless to say. So yeah. um, I think naturally over time, that's going to kind of self self-solve for lack of a better description but what stands out to me also is that i mean it's kind of like one ginormous multi kind of marketing funnel that never really exists it's just a little bit of an unusual funnel right and then you look at like what you can affect in the funnel as well right so you know you're trying to mint out how, how many what was the max min, mint count on, on your project originally we we did a five thousand piece collection at initially it was 0.06 um, and it got to the point in those final couple of weeks and final couple of days that we we, we slowly decreased the price more and more um, to the point that I think we ended up at uh, 5,000 pieces of 0.015 um, and, it, and it didn't sell out at that point I think we'd only sold like 200 or so of them and uh, it just kind of tapered off from there by, by the way before we go into like the funnel comment that I was about to make if, if you did do a better, I'll kind of merge this with a question we have from the crowd, which is uh, Scott goes asking if you can go back and launch it again, would you change anything about the approach to marketing? But I'm going to merge that with the question that I had in mind too, which is um, if you did hype it up more, meaning, you know, merging with his question of, if, you know, would you have changed anything? If you did hype it up more, do you think you could have used any proxy or anything to determine earlier on whether there truly was a demand for 5,000 at, at 0 0.06 or a demand for 5,000 at 0 0.015? Is there anything, any signal or anything you could have grabbed or anything you could have done that you think would have given you very high level of confidence that the demand actually existed before you even moved on product and anything else? I think I could have just looked at the market to be totally honest. I could have just seen what other projects were selling at, uh, you know, se selling out for or not selling out for um, in the current market. I think that again, I think we were. It was mostly me. I'll, I'll take full responsibility. Um, I, I was delusional in thinking that we were better. I was delusional in thinking, hey, we have a better project. We have a docs team. We spent all this money on lawyers. We're compliant. You know, we're, we're doing this the right way, quote unquote. Uh, and, and I thought that the market would 
at least a little bit care about that or, you know, at minimum respect that. Um, and it just wasn't the case. Um, as far as I think what we could have done more on the marketing side of things, um, I think there certainly would have been ways for us to, within the bounds of our values, um, get the project in front of more people. Um, I think towards the end, uh, a lot of our team were, were tired. We were burnt out. We'd been working on this for a year and a half. We'd been putting, you know, 60 hours a week every week, you know, while, you know, our, our artist is going to college full time, you know, we all have full time jobs. Um, and so it, it was really just, you know, a passion project every night and on the weekends. Um, and I think that we were we were too deep, um, and we'd gotten kicked in the balls too many times um, that we were just like, at this point, fuck it, just drop it. You know, we we need to get this out. You know, it, and it was also a race against the market itself because we didn't know it. It, it was always increasing our risk every single day that we didn't drop the project because we didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow. We didn't yeah. know if USDC was going to crash. We didn't know if Coinbase was going to blow up. We didn't know if Yuga Labs was going to rug and the whole pace, you know, the whole space was going to obliterate itself. So, yeah. you know, that, that's the way that I thought of it at the time, at least, is every day that we didn't launch, we were increasing our risk. Just throwing it out there, there, there was a positive outcome that existed, which which is the market turns positive at some point. <laughs> yes, yeah, for sure. You know, and, and that's kind of interesting that we, as far as the USDC comment, we launched yeah. like a day or two after that whole USDC, USDC thing. Um, yeah. And that was when the market was up. That's when everyone was excited and happy because USDC didn't collapse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a fair point. It's a fair, the timing comment is definitely something that we know exists and we can come back to. I have my own thoughts and thesis I talked about with Yuga in the past, but going back to like the, the mega funnel thing, right? Like it's almost like, let's assume that there's a hundred thousand people floating around the space, which is not accurate anymore, right? In this market. Not at all. Let's just, <laughs> let's just like for illustrative purposes say that there's a hundred thousand yeah. people that are touching the space pr pretty decently, right? Uh, much like, you know, the, the experts and, and awesome people in MBHQ who are touching the space, right? So let's say it's a hundred thousand people, right? So you have 100,000 people, let's just say you even reached the 100,000 people for argument's sake, right? Only Y per, X percent is going to give a single shit about it, right? Of those mm. people who give a shit, Y percent are gonna actually stay sticky. Z percent of those who stay sticky, you know, you know, may have ADD and drop off as a result of it. Mm. Those who actually stay sticky and stay attached may not like the price point. Those who do, you know, who do like the price point and wanna go may not, you know, remember mint day or something like that. And, 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 mm. and, and I'm doing it like very, yeah. very short, right? So it just oh, kind of yeah. suggests to me, as you start to look at the levers that we've seen pass across projects, right? You, you, we see many projects where they just way over allocate, you know, the, the the whitelist, right? At the end of the day, and it obviously pisses people off, and it's high demand and gas wars and all those kinds of things. And also, it's maybe just the right way to launch the project at the end of the day, right? Like, yeah, I mean that that I, I'll. I'll get into it. That was one of our biggest mistakes was how we and, and it was one of the things that I was the most proud of. But it was one of our biggest mistakes was how we managed our allow list process. Um, basically, what we did for the allow list is it was an application similar to like, you know, D gods or whatever. You had to answer some questions. Um, but the questions were like super simple. Um, you could complete it in like two or five minutes. It wasn't like, you know, give your entire background on your whole life. Um, and what happens is once you answer those questions, you minted a free soulbound token, and that kind of acted as your your kind of pass. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, if you received the allow list, the um, art uh, of the and the metadata of the soulbound token would dynamically change, and so you could see all on chain completely transparency. This is how many people submitted the application. This is how many people received the allow list. Uh, this is who received the allow list. And so it was a way for us to, you know, be transparent about that whole application process and, you know, not over allocated. We were very adamant about not over allocating. Again, that kind of over righteousness. Was it was it too transparent in hindsight? I, I hate to say that, but was it too transparent? I, I do think that there are some places where, and, and I'm more transparent than most. I'll, I'll tell you anything. I, don't, I have no secrets. <laughs> I'm the most candid person you'll meet. And, and um, I, but, I mean, it's worth but I think, we're, we're only talking about this from the project owner standpoint, right? If you're a project yes, owner, yeah. listening to this, or an aspiring project owner, and you're trying to mint out, you know, mint out your project, right? I mean, the key question here is, do you need excess demand at the end of the day? Do you need to ensure yeah. there's excess demand? And needless to say, it's a little bit tricky to disclose. If you wanted to go 3x or 4x on demand, 
it would be very hard to do that. If you wanted to go like 1.5 or 1.25 excess mm-hmm. demand, you could probably get away with disclosing that. People know there's a little bit of gas wars. They know where you're coming from. But if it's yeah. two, three, four times, it may look just ridiculous at the end of the day. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I met long. people who were going 30x demand. You know, I, <laughs> I met people who had, um, like, I, I had talked to a marketer kind of around that time of Invictus order who wanted to market, and I say that with a drip of sarcasm, uh, our project. Um, and he was showing me all of his numbers and he was showing me all the projects that uh, had been rugged in the past that he marketed for. Um, and, and, it, and he was showing me like, yeah, it was a 5,000 collection pro- or, uh, piece of collection and uh, we had 160,000 people on the allow list. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> they're not, um, maybe they're not just bots in, in some of these discords at the end of the day. Maybe it is actually yeah. 250. <laughs> um, so, okay, so I think we spent a lot of time focusing on the internal. Let's maybe talk about the external a little bit too, right? So, you know, in your mind, what, were, what was the landscape, you know, when, when you actually had your project and when the Mint came and even when you were hyping it up before? And what other elements externally do you think factored into the outcome, if you had to say, that were, you know, maybe a little bit of out, outside of your control and that maybe you could have had some influence on, right, or made decisions off of, but what were the external factors that you think existed? So I think that there was there was interplay between three kind of conflicting parties um, throughout throughout the whole uh, pro- project. Um, the the biggest one the the biggest thing that was not within our control was Grey Havens. Great Grey Havens, obviously the company that owns Spiral Knights. We're trying to buy this game from them, and so you know we we talked with them frequently. We we offered them certain things. We um, you know we we presented kind of what our plan was for them um, and for for the game, um, and you know they were. They, they talked to us. They they responded, um, but you know their kind of stance was, we don't really you know as a small indie gaming company with not that much left to lose, we don't really want to be associated with NFTs in any capacity. We don't want to hear you know Spiral Knights, Grey Havens, and NFTs in the same sentence. Um, and so they they said we're perfectly happy for you guys to do your own thing. You can launch the project. You can do whatever. Go go have fun. Just don't say our name, please. Um, and so there was, while there was this understanding with Grey Havens internally that like, hey, if we raised this money, buying the game was a real possibility. Um, but, uh, you know, externally, when we talked to our community, when we talked to, you know, potential investors, we, we couldn't say that. We couldn't say, oh, yeah, Grey Havens will sell us the game if we raise the money. Uh, we, we had to say, you know, we're in contact with Grey Havens, and that's about it. Um, and, and you know, for a lot of people, that wasn't enough. Um, and so there was kind of that interplay between our relationship with Grey Havens and how quiet we had to keep that, and how we we didn't want to expose Grey Havens to you know any bad press. We didn't want to make them upset. We didn't want to devalue the game, certainly. Um, so you know there was that that interplay, and then there was you know two other factors. There was the game's current community. These are diehards. These are people that have played this game for the last decade and have years worth of playtime on this game. Um, they hated NFTs. They hated us. They thought we were sellouts. They thought that we were just trying to grift the game and make a quick buck off the player base, um, e- even though we were kind of widely respected members of, of the Spiral Knights community. Um, and so, you know, we, we got a lot of hate. You know, one of our team members, like I had mentioned earlier, left the team because of that. He, he valued his, his friendships and his relationships in Spiral Knights more than kind of the ultimate outcome. So, uh, you know, we parted ways amicably, but he just couldn't take it. Um, I got death threats, you know. So there was there was the the Spiral Knights community who who wanted no part of that. They wanted no part of what we were doing. Um, and then there was the NFT community who they're just looking for the quick flip. They're they're just looking for their next you know 0.2 ETH profit uh, or 0.02 ETH profit. Um, and so it was a balance of you know, th- those kind of three external factors of, you know, how can we still preserve this game for the Spiral Knights players who think that we're going to maim it and, you know, extract money out of this game? How do we preserve the business um, so that we can actually attain our goals with Grey Havens? And then, you know, how do we uh, preserve 
at least some level of uh, marketing and interest uh, among the NFT crowd, all while maintaining our virtues and values. Yeah, yeah, that's a tough balance that exists. Um, <laughs> not not an easy one. Lot, lot, multiple challenges that exist, and and maybe even some others beyond that. In theory, and, and I'm going to tie into a, another crowd question that we have, which is um, your opinion. If you had to distill, would you take an epic A plus or A game or so, or not even game project in a very cold market, like like a you know a bear market, cold market, or would you take you know maybe a C or a B level project? in a really hot market. What, right, what, are you talking what? about a game or an NFT project? Yeah, I'd, say, I'd say an NFT project in general, but if you want to focus on NFT games specifically, that's it, fine. But just take, take any in, NFT in project, the, I guess I'd say. In the context of what, like like just for buying for investment, I, I'm not sure. Mint, like Minting out, to, to, to mint out. So, sorry, sorry. give, give me the question again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so sure I understand. if you had to place your bet of an, an A plus project, Min, or an A project minting out in a really cold market, or oh, okay, you know, okay, okay, okay. I see, or a I see what you're project saying. minting out in an A or an A plus market. What would be? What would you choose at the end of the day? Um, I, I think the shitty project in the in the bull market every every single time. Yeah, nine, nine times yeah. out of ten, the shitty project in the bull market. Yeah, well, I, I would. I, I don't know. Plus one on that. I'm I'm very much siding with that one. Um, I definitely think a shittier project in in a really good market far surpasses if you can somehow construct it though raga maybe like tying into your experience and what you think you know went right went wrong you know whatever else and you can kind of just at a high level like reconstruct a perfect project that you think might have a good shot in a, in a c market in, in in a colder market right um what kinds of things would you do in theory um to, to really get it right like well, what's the recipe in your mind for a project that has a shot of minting out in a cold market one of the the phrases that i've really liked in the past like week or two since jj said it to me the other day um and, and this is apparently like an internal motto that yuga labs has is make people afraid to sell um obviously that sounds kind of like brash and harsh when you hear it for the first time um, but from the company's pers perspective it makes perfect sense and so um you know we we had um kind of those Ponzi elements to Invictus Order. Like we had things in the works that would have been, you know, like you owned this NFT and then you get this thing, which, you know, there's some game aspect to it and there's these riddles and you can combine these things together to get this. And that thing would eventually be an asset in the game. Um, and so like, like I think those... Ponzi elements, so to speak, um, for, for lack of a better word, um, the, the things to keep people interested, the, the things to keep stringing people along. Um, I, I think it's, it's hard for me, at least, to, and, and again, this might be one of the reasons why Invictus Order failed, um, is I'm very long-term. I'm very... I think I'm too long term. I, I was trying to build a company. I was trying to build, you know, all right, we're going to do this for the next 20 years at least. Um, and, and I wasn't giving a lot of credence to um, the here and now or, or not as much as it, I should have at least mm -hmm. um, not as much as I could have. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, a, a lot of these other projects that are, you know, if it's a shitty project launching in a bear market, um, they didn't have the constraints that we had. They didn't have, you know, the the decrepit company that you needed to keep happy. They didn't have the, <laughs> the gaming community that you needed to keep happy. Um, they only had to deal with the NFT space, and it's pretty easy to please those people in a bear market. Or, or in a bull yeah. market, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if, if we had to distill, let's just focus on the, the gaming market for a second, right? Because I know this is, again, a really hot topic, a really hot kind of uh, mm. sub-vertical, I guess, within the space, right? If we just simply distilled, distilled it to two segments, just for simplicity's sake, it's far more complex than that, but just let's distill it to two segments for simplicity's sake, okay? There's investors and traders, pure profit motive, and there's gamers, right? It, are those two at like total total conflict? Like no. since you're far more of a gamer than I am, certainly, are those two a total total conflict? Like, is there a world in which both of those can play within the same game and not have an issue? Like, is that even possible to do, or does it have it, to be these kind of hybrid people who you know care about profit motive but also enjoy the game? Which is, I feel like, in my opinion, how it's framed more often is people have to also like the game, kind of a thing, right? But can it also be the alternative where some segment just really likes the game and some segment is 
just a bunch of traders and investors and th- th- can that fit I, I, I do think it can because we've already seen that happen. We've already seen that happen. You know, I've seen it happen in Spiral Knights. I've seen people who love the game and play the game and will buy, you know, the, the most expensive thing um, and, and they don't participate at all in the, the merchanting or the, the reselling aspect of the game. Um, you know, we, we've seen it in CSGO. We've seen it in TF2. We've seen it in Dota. We've seen people, you know, who purely just want to enjoy the game a little bit more, have the disposable income to do so, and are, and are willing to spend on, on virtual assets. Um, That's interesting. As far as, yeah. Go ahead. No, 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 go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was, I, was, I was done. It's super interesting with you framing it like that, right? Because what I'm kind of hearing from you that I hadn't thought of it like this before is like, essentially you have a bunch of like sellers and a bunch of buyers at the end of the day, right? You have people whose interest is farming and optimizing, making money, whatever else. And people who just buy assets at the end of the day, it's just an economy, mm-hmm. for lack of a better description. And even more interesting is like within that gamer segment, you know, they do it for like both introspective reasons, right? Because they like having it and they're proud and it makes them happy and all those things. And maybe some like extra extra perspectives as well, right? That other people get to see it and social status and mm-hmm. all those kinds of things. But it's all within that segment, right? They're doing it because the other gamers are able to see it, for, you know, for, for, for at least the external perspective as well, right? Yeah. So it seems like very, very And there's very certainly cool. some crossover between both. There's certainly people who are playing the game and enjoying it and also, you know, flipping stuff. I mean, I, yeah. I when I started out, I was flipping stuff to enjoy the game more, to get those kinds of assets. Yeah, that, that's a fair point. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a spectrum. There, there's no doubt about it. Is there a limit, though, in terms of the economy? Like, is one of the constraints... We, we've talked about this in a different way many, many times, or at least I've, I've been either part or seen these conversations. But is there a limit and therefore a challenge that exists because NFT gaming assets have been priced too high. And as a result, that economy that we're referring to just can't work because there aren't people. Or is there a world in which the buyers, again, I'm making it a little bit too you know, discreet and binary in this case, just for simplicity purposes, but like the buyers will pay $100,000 for the sickest one of a kind, you know, one of asset because it's the coolest thing ever. The game has so much, you know, uh, credence in the world. Like, is that possible? Is, is there a world where it gets to that? Not unlike, you know, people will buy the best PFP project for 100K or a million because it is that much kind of social status and, and everything else. Is, is that possible in gaming? So I'll, I'll say two things. One, it's already happening. People are already spending multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars on CSGO skins. It, it's already happening. Um, and because it's already happening, that, and, and this is something that I've been preaching for the last two years. Um, first of all, it takes a fun game. That, that, that is the absolute baseline. That is the absolute bare minimum. And right now, I, I hear so many people saying there's gaming, there's Web2 gaming, and then there's blockchain gaming or NFT gaming or Web3 gaming. I don't think that they're that different. I, I don't think that they should no. be different. And I don't think that <laughs> in two to five years, they will be different. I think yeah. that, you know, when, when people talk about Web3 gaming as if it's this new thing. No, it's just gaming. It's just gaming. Yeah. Gaming is gaming. Um, and so the, the way that I think of it as, uh, or, or I think of it as the NFT and blockchain technology is just a means to an end. It's a way to enable the things that we've already been doing. The, the, the guy who spends $300,000 on a knife in CSGO is still going to want to spend $300,000 on a knife in CSGO, except now he actually really owns that. Yeah. And the transactions can be made easier, and and then right I, exactly. I totally it's, what you're saying. it's more efficient. Mm-hmm. It's more transparent. Um, the, the the way that I like to call it, that I, I don't know if this will this will ever be a phrase that's coined, but I, I call it the three E's: uh, engaging, efficient, and experience. That that's what NFTs are for. It creates yeah. new experiences. It makes things more engaging, and it makes things more efficient. You you Is can just. Sl- what was that? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, you could just slap those three E's onto any industry. If you're selling <laughs> shoes, three E's, you know, just just change yeah, yeah. the way that uh, you're selling shoes, make it more efficient, you know, make it more engaging. Yeah, definitely getting excited over here as well uh, about what you're saying. And it's definitely getting the wheels turning. I'm wondering if like the, the, the banner headline that exists to convince normies to go into Web3 is something like, you know, the tagline, something like, you know, Web3 because you've been doing this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> basically, basically, it's it's you buy your Fortnite skin and now you own it instead of Fortnite owning it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. same same exact thing, you know. Super <laughs> funny. Um, another crowd question that we have is maybe a little bit looking back as well. I don't know if you have a perfect gauge for this answer for, for this question, but 
just your opinion from what you can what you can tell. Given you know the question is given the smaller audience for gaming and Web three and traders, especially now, do you think many pro gaming projects test product market fit before actually releasing? So said differently, back to the kind of that question I asked earlier, do you think they'll actually put out a bunch of push and promotion and hype, maybe without building products, for instance? and gauge based on clicks or signups or whatever else it is, right? Whatever proxy they want to use, whether they have a possible winner here or not. I mean, I think Yuga Labs, the forge that they're doing right now is a perfect example of that. It's an absolutely awful game, but I'm sure the metrics of it are incredible. And so, um, you know, it, I guess this ties back into the, the initial question that you had about Yuga Labs and like kind of where they're at right now that I never ended up answering. But like, I think... I think Yuga Labs is, one, they're trying stuff out. They're practicing. Um, but I worry that um, something like what they did with the Forge, where, you know, it, very, it feels very predatory, for lack of a better word. Um, and it feels... You know, as somebody who I'm, I'm not a big holder. I have one of these things, um, and, and I'm managing the heavies of a bunch of other people. It, it feels like a a big value transfer and a value suck from holders to non-holders, and I don't think that's a good thing. Um, you know, for the longevity of the project, for Yuga Labs, for the game, for sentiment, it's not a good thing. Yeah, that makes that makes total sense. So, all right, let, let's tie like a nice bow up on on this combo so far at least as we get towards the end of uh, of, of the episode if you, i mean if you had to distill raga you know talking through this your own thoughts otherwise and you had to distill it really top three you know reasons that you think your project i don't even want to call it fail because i don't think it's that you know what i don't think like that i know you don't think like that but you yeah. know just for simplicity's sake what were the top three reasons if you really had to distill it um if, you know for the crowd i think I think there's one big reason, and then it encompasses kind of all the other reasons. Uh, I think that the main one was I was too product focused. Um, I, I wanted the product to be great. I wanted us to have the best product. Um, and so th all of our decisions were product based um, instead of kind of marketing based or, or simply necessity based. Um, we didn't really think about what was necessary. We didn't really think about um, what we needed to do. We just kind of thought of what we what we wanted to do um, and, and how best we wanted to see the project. And, and ultimately, it was me. I was the NFT guy on the scene. I, I was the one leading the company. It, it really fell on me, um, where I, I was making the project in the image of what I wanted to see in the space. I wanted more transparency. I wanted more professional. I wanted, you know, new standards set on technology, um, and and we did all of those things, and I'm proud of those things. Um, but that, that that's kind of what dragged it down is, you know, we were so product focused, we put so much into the art. I mean, fuck, the art is, and I'll still say this to this day. I, I you know, obviously haven't seen every single project in the space, but. I'd venture to say that our art was more complex and more in depth than any project ever released, um, and yet it didn't sell out and yet people didn't care you know but but we spent a year and two months on the art um and we you know developed a whole new system of art generation because it didn't exist um and, and so yeah I, I think just we were too product focused i was too product focused um and not marketing focused enough um like I had said earlier, I think I was too caught up in my own righteousness and too caught up in the long term to see the short term. Um, and, and then obviously, you know, those external factors. We, we, like I said, we got kicked in the balls felt like once a week, man. It felt like it felt like every single, you know, week we had, you know, a new conversation with Grey Havens or we had to pivot this way. Oh my god, pivot became like a joke word among the team. We, all right, we got to pivot again. We have to change our plan again, you know. The the thing that we had uh, you know, starting January 2022 went through 40, 50 iterations by the time that we launched. Um, dramatic iterations sometimes, uh, just because of, you know, we were burdened by the market, we were burdened by Grey Havens, and we were burdened by kind of trying to appease all of them at once, the Spiral Knights community, the NFT community, all of that. Wow, that's, that's, that's a lot. Never, 
Uh, by the way, 51 episodes in now. Has there been an episode more befitting of this show's name for <laughs> numbers therapy for, for whatever it's worth? Uh, definitely, definitely uh, dissecting it and getting it out. If, if, Rag, if you had to do it again, um, you know, top of the list, like what, what changes at that point if you, if you had to do it again? I think there are ways where, where we can still market the project within our values. And, and I think that marketing kind of would have been that, that main focus. I'm not educated enough on marketing. My, my homeschooling in business and, and what I've done so far, it's all about building companies long term. I, I, I try to study, I study a lot of corporate history and I study a lot of um, like biographies of CEOs. And, and a lot of them are companies that have been around for 20, 50, 100, 200 years. And that's the lens that I take on business and that's the lens that I take on life. Um, and I think just just putting a little bit more oomph into that short term, just trying to uh, put a little bit more oomph into, into marketing where we could. Um, frankly, spending more money on marketing. We didn't spend any money on marketing. It was all grassroots. It was all, you know, mercenary marketing. We, we had nothing. It was just, you know, word of mouth, you know, a couple posts on Twitter, some cool art. I mean... That's time. That's that's bringing back full circle, right? That's the necessary but not sufficient, right? The necessary but not yeah. sufficient is the short term, making sure that mm -hmm. the short term situation is good enough to be able to get you the capital, to get you to the place you need to go, and then you could lock into the long term plan. It seems like, right? But I think that that parallel goes for, I guess, anything, right? Not just web web three and NFT projects. I guess, I guess, any of and, them. And and yet at the same time, not compromising your virtues and values in the short yeah. term. It's that, yeah. um, you know, I, I love this this. Uh, Jim Collins concept, the genius of the and. You can't have short term or long term. You don't, you don't want either one. You want both. You need both. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's it's really well said. I, I totally agree with that. Last question, Rag, are we gonna we gonna see you release again? What's what's on what's on the docket? Are we taking a break? Is it gonna happen soon? What what what's going on there? Um I mean, when, when, when we stepped back from the project, we kind of we kind of put it on ice. We kind of put it on the back burner. Um, we, we also kind of had a little falling out with our devs. Um, and, and so I'm actually, because they won't respond back to me, I'm actually not sure what the current state of the contract is. Um, last that I had thought about it or worried about it, we had intended to uh, turn the project to just a free mint, just because we wanted to get the art out there. We spent a year and a half on the art. We just wanted to get it out there. Um, and, you know, if it was free, so be it. We've already paid off all of our debts out of our own pockets. So it wasn't like we wanted to make any more money off of this. Um, but I don't even think that that's the case. I, I don't know what the current state of our contract is. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure beyond... Um, Grey Havens, you know, because we still have that relationship with Grey Havens and kind of their parting thoughts to us with all of this was like, you know, hey, sorry, it didn't work out. You know, we we didn't think it would work out to begin with. You know, good thing we didn't align ourselves with you guys. Um, but but kind of throughout our conversations with Grey Havens, they had always kind of, you know, <laughs> softly, you know, sometimes not softly, mostly just softly said, hey, you know, if, we're, if we ever do want to sell the game, if we, ever, we are ever done with this, you guys would be the one to take it. You know, we, we want stewards of the game. We want somebody who's going to take our legacy and actually love it and cherish it, you know, like you guys do. So, you know, maybe there comes a time down the line. I don't know if it's a year. I don't know if it's five years. I don't know if it's 15 years when, uh, you know, Maybe the game shuts down. Uh, maybe there's something for us to do there. Um, I, I don't think that we would ever deviate from the Spiral Knights angle because that was what we were passionate about to begin with. It, it wouldn't just be, hey, let's spin up another project because this one didn't work. You know, it, it would very, it have to be something that we care about and that we're passionate about. Um, but as far as the the NFT itself. I don't know. I, I think it's still actually possible to mint, but I think it's 0.015 um, instead of being free. I don't. I, I haven't. I haven't had a conversation with our devs in months. So, Greg, I'm just I throwing this out you. there. I'm just throwing this out there, man, because we like thinking about you know ways to make money in business. So I'll add my little uh, one cent today, which I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. Which is given given this lack of of recent confidence that uh, that they have with you possibly selling it, selling out your project, and we didn't think it was going to sell out. Just throwing it out there, re-release, 
negotiate terms in advance that if it sells out, they sell it and you get a major discount as a result of it because they don't have confidence. Just throwing it out there, to be honest with you. They don't think, they don't think it's highly likely. You got you have a perfect angle that exists, but to anybody that's listening in the crowd, all I'm hearing right now for whatever it's worth is that this is definitely, Rag is definitely coming out with another project sometime in the next year. That, that's, that's what I hear in the background for whatever it's worth. So, I hope fall down, not. Fall I down hope seven to times, get up eight. But I think in your times, just in your case, it's just going to be fall down once, get up. I'll get up twice and it's going to work perfect, but um, <laughs> really awesome conversation, Raga, today. Just unusually good and, and, and really, really appreciate, you know, you coming on and being so open and talking it through and us going back and forth. So really, really awesome and, and just phenomenal. So thank you so much for coming on today. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, everyone listening live, appreciate you, appreciate the questions. Um, and of course, everyone listening, uh, you know, in a recorded as well. So thanks so much. We'll see everyone similar time next week, everyone. Thanks so much. Of course. Thank you. It was great.